Well, hello everyone. This is track number three, and here we have Catalina Astengo. And Catalina, the room is all yours. Thanks, Francia. Hey guys, I'm super excited to be here. This is my first conference talk ever, so bear with me. I'm going to be talking to you about gRPC and Elixir microservices. Um, I am a senior software engineer at NAV. And at NAV, we do uh, intelligent small business financing. We use real business data to quickly match people with the best loans and credit cards in our marketplace. And in order to make that all work, we have a ton of backend services. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story of when I first I joined, when I first joined NAV. I walked into a wild, wild west of microservices. We had this large uh, monolithic Ruby app that we started breaking down into smaller microservices. And any new functionality also came along in a way of a microservice. And these ended up being in all sorts of different languages like Go and Elixir, luckily, uh, Ruby, Python, etc. So these older apps had REST endpoints for the front end to communicate with them, but we started adding GraphQL to a lot of these apps and really start liking it. So at least we standardized that part of our front end to back end communication that we wanted it to be in GraphQL. And this was working out pretty well for us. Um, but then we kind of decided that it would be nicer to have an API gateway that the front end would use. So it would only have one endpoint to go to for GraphQL. And then the API gateway should know where to go to get that data via Graph GraphQL. So at first we, uh, we had the API gateway. Um, it's basically considered a backend app because it's um, just providing data to the front end, but it got all of its data from the backend services. And we decided to have it in JavaScript because we were leveraging Apollo tooling to do this uh, thing called schema stitching in which the API gateway introspected each of the backend schemas to build one data graph for the front end to use. And this was working pretty great for a little bit. Um, but as we added more of these backend GraphQL services, we started having a little bit of issues with type collisions uh, just because these backend services had been moving independently from each other for so long. They had to find their own types, not really considering what the other applications would if they would define the same types as that app. So um, we decided to move all of our GraphQL definitions into our API gateway, and then it would just know where to get them in the backend instead of introspecting the schema. So this kind of freed up our backend service communication from GraphQL. GraphQL is you know, kind of a heavy uh, overhead on each of these apps. And we didn't want the type definition to live in, inside of them. So we started considering other technologies for this. And this is when gRPC got brought up as a way for our backend services to communicate with each other. So you might be wondering, what is gRPC? So gRPC is a high performance, open source, universal RPC framework. RPC basically gives you the ability to directly call a function on another service. So here on this image, I have the, my server on the left and clients on the right. And the clients just kind of get this thing called gRPC stub where they call the functions. It's just kind of like a client uh, module. And they, then this makes a proto request to the gRPC server, which responds with a proto response. Um, this communication happens via, by default, via protocol buffers. Protocol buffers are Google's mature open source mechanism for serializing structured data. So when the gRPC, when the client sends a request to the server, it sends it in a proto request and that gets encoded into binary, which then gets decoded by the server side and then vice versa uh, from the server to the client side. So um, protobuf works with HTTP2 and that's why it's able to encapsulate all this data into binary and return it to the front end. So these binary payloads are a lot lighter and more compact than if you were sending like a plain text um, 
message from the front end to the back, or from between this back end uh, applications. All right, so why did we decide to use gRPC at NAV? gRPC is great for when you have all these microservices in different languages. And like I explained before, we have Go, Python, JavaScript, Elixir. So this made it like really awesome for us to use just because you can define your service and its methods once, and then you can generate code for all of these languages by just running one command. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, also, because performance is important. You don't wanna be sending this giant plain text uh, request if you can actually encode it into binary and make it a lot more efficient and compact. Uh, with protocol buffers you also and gRPC, you also get if really efficient client libraries just because it feels like you're just calling a function within your app. It just makes it feel like you're not coding any of the implementation details of the connection. So it makes it really great and nice for the client side. Also, you get great, great team collaboration on these service definitions. You get to define your service and its input types and it all, you can have it in a collaborative repository where other engineers can comment on your types and make decisions that way. Finally, this is really nice. Uh, you decouple the service definition from its implementation. So it's really easy to swap services. If you wanna make a new app that it's going to start providing data for a service, all you have to do on the client side is just change the URL. And then you should get, since you have the same contract, the data stays the same. So it's really easy to swap services. Now I've explained a lot. So we're going to jump into kind of a demo. I chose to do it in Pokemon because I've been playing a lot of Pokemon Sword. It's really fun. And I'm going to show you all of these concepts that I just uh, brought up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have an Elixir app that's a Pokemon repo that's going to act as the server. Then we're going to have a Pokedex app, which is going to be the client of in this scenario. And it's going to get Pokemon data from the Pokemon repo. Both of these apps are going to include a library called Pokemon Proto, which is going to have our proto definitions, our a generated Elixir code, and kind of like a wrapper for the gRPC library. The Pokemon repo is going to implement a gRPC server that we're going to write, and then the Pokedex client will use the gRPC stub to call functions on the server via proto request, and then the server will respond with a proto response to the client. So let's jump in. What is it like working with protobufs? So with protobufs, which is short for protocol buffers, um, we write a proto definition. This is everything about our service. Uh, what the service is called, what methods can be called in the service, what parameters it takes in, what it returns. And you write all of these definitions in proto files. And then with that proto file, you can actually generate code in any language that you want, as long as it has like a library support for it. So we actually generate it in Python, Ruby, JavaScript, Go, and Elixir from the same file, files. Um, and after you run the compiler, you get all this code, and then you can import and use in your libraries. And it's so easy because you didn't have to write anything but one file, and now you got code in all these different languages, all right? So what are the requirements to get started on this? Uh, first of all, you want to install protobuf. So you can do that with brew by calling brew install protobuf. And then you want to install the Elixir compiler for the protobufs because we're going to be generating Elixir code. And you do that with the uh, hex library for protobuf. So you just run mix ESScript.install hex protobuf and just make sure that your protoc gen Elixir is in your path. Additional instructions are in the library if you're interested. Optionally, you can also install gRPC curl, which is like curl, but just for gRPC. We're not gonna be getting into it today because I don't have enough time, but it is a nice tool when you're testing out your server. So let's get started uh, with our protocol buffers. We're going to write out what our proto, our Pokemon service is going to look like. Uh, I'm going to start a folder called Poke API and I'm going to put this pokemon.proto file in it. And the first thing I wanna do is just state the version of proto that I'm using. So I just say syntax equals proto three, which is the latest version. And then this is what I'm gonna call my package. It's kind of like a namespace for it. Uh, it's optional, but if you want to keep your stuff organized, you want to give your stuff package names. 
And then we get started with defining our service. This is kind of like a struct. So you just say, this is a service. It's going to be called Pokemon service. It has one method in it called get Pokemon that takes in a get Pokemon request and returns a get Pokemon response. These are just message types that I'm defining here. So I'm going to jump into our first message type, which is get Pokemon request. All of these composite types are made up out of scalar fields. So for example, here I have an N32 field type of name ID, and then I assign a field number one. So these field numbers are the only kind of complicated thing here. Um, it's just so it recognizes, it can identify things in the binary format. So you don't have to worry too much about it, but you usually just use increasing numbers. You do want to reserve one through 15 for your most frequently used messages, just because they're easier, uh, takes less bytes to encode, but we usually just logically go up in our field names, in our field numbers. So I have the N32 ID and a string name that the Pokemon request will take. And then we define what our Pokemon response looks like. And here you can see I'm returning a field that returns a Pokemon type. Uh, and I just assigned field number one. This is a composite types, which is just made out of scalars. And then I just have to define what the Pokemon looks like. So here's my message Pokemon. Uh, with an N32 of ID, string name, N32 base experience, and a Boolean of its default. All of these fields that are returned via gRPC are optional. There's no way to make it required. So you should be expecting to either get it or not get it. But if you do send something that's nil, it will get replaced by that type's default. So for example, if I send nil for the Pokemon name, it's actually going to be replaced by an empty string. For numbers, you get zero, and for Boolean, you get false. And this is when the relationship got kind of rocky between Elixir and protocol buffers, because we use a nil for a lot of stuff. Nil is a thing. I'm sorry, Go. Um, but how can you differentiate a zero being nil from a zero being an actual number. It's uh, just bonkers. But anyways, moving on, we're going to also add a moves field for our Pokemon because what is a Pokemon without moves, right? So that is called a repeated field, which just means it's a list of zero to more items. So we uh, denote that by saying repeated and then the type, which is move, and then the field name moves, and then we just assign the next number five. And then we just define what that moves looks like. Um, it's just another message type. It has an ID, name, accuracy, effects change, and PP. So gRPC also has other field types that I'm not going to go into detail today, but it has an enumeration uh, field type, which is just one value from a predefined list of values. It also has an any, which is just a message as an embedded type that doesn't have a proto definition. There's also a one of which is a, a field that could have many types, but you only return one at a time. And then you have a map, uh, for example, like a string key to string value map. You have to uh, say what key type and then what key values you get. We usually use this for like an errors map uh, that we return in the response if anything goes wrong. Other features that gRPC has that I'm also not getting into today are streaming and integrated auth. So how are we going to set up this proto library? So we already have our proto definition for Pokemon. Um, and now we just need to create an Elixir app. No Phoenix, no Ecto, nothing, just plain Elixir app. And then we're going to put our proto definition in there. And then we're going to make sure that in our mix file, we start up the gRPC application under our application function. And then we want to include the following dependencies. We need gRPC uh, that comes from the GitHub. And then they say in their documentation there that you should put Calib and override it because of some things that are going on. And then we want to make sure we use Google Protos. There are all other types of protocol buffers, but we are using Google because it's kind of like the industry default. So we're going to also use that for our project. Next, we are going to generate the code um, and we already installed our hex package for compiling. So we're just going to write this one line, uh, proto compiler. So protoc, elixir out, plugins, gRPC. We're going to output the code into the lib directory and we're grabbing it from this Poke API folder. Once we run that, 
we get a file generated inside our tree here in the left. It's under Poke API folder under lib and it's called pokemon.pb.ex and it looks a little bit like this. You actually have modules for all the structs that we define in our proto file. Um, but here I'm just showing you what the Pokemon one looks like. Uh, so there's a lot of specific library stuff in here, but we can see here that we get a type that we can use in our specs. And we also get a struct. This stuff is like really nice just because you already know what fields you're coming in, you get guaranteed types. So it's all super nice. You also get a bunch of other stuff. So if we walk into an IEX session in the project, um, you can see here that everything is packaged into this Poke API module. And then you get modules for get Pokemon requests, get Pokemon response, the move, the Pokemon, the Pokemon service. And each of these modules comes with a bunch of functions built in. Like for example, Pokemon comes with a dot new that to create a Pokemon struct it also comes with encode and decode to encode from into two bytes. Uh, same with the get Pokemon request and all the basic structs that we defined. And you can see here that with the Pokemon service stub, I actually get the get Pokemon function. So this is what the client will use to uh, just call that remotely on their server. So it's just going to feel like, oh, well, I'm just calling a function that's in my app, really. So. And that will take in a channel and a request I'll go into here next. So let's all take a deep breath. I know I need one. Um, we've got done a lot. We defined what our service is gonna look like, what types is gonna return. We generated Elixir code from our file. And then we're gonna just commit that and push it to GitHub so we can then use it in our applications. So the way we just, we set up our uh, client and our server apps is just, we, all we need to do is just import our Pokemon Proto where we have all that stuff that I just said. Um, and that's all the dependencies we need. That, that comes with gRPC or all of our Poke API stuff. So we're ready to go. So let's set up the server. So this is how you would set up a gRPC server. This is just a plain Elixir app again. Um, and we just make sure we go into the config in that we start the server. You don't wanna start it for tests, but you do wanna start it for development and production probably, right? So just make sure that you start your server. And then in your application.ex, you want to make sure that you start your gRPC endpoint under the gRPC.server.supervisor that comes with the library. So we're just setting it up here as the children of our application and then we just pass it the port 8080 so our server is going to be available at localhost 8080 for our client app to use so let's see what the endpoint looks like so the grpc endpoint um, you have to use grpc endpoint from the grpc library and then we set up a if you're familiar with Phoenix, this will interceptors will be kind of like your plug. They just intercept the request on the way in and then on the way out. So for example, it comes with this built-in gRPC logger for your server. So this will just log in the request coming in and then just say, okay, I returned an okay. So you can actually see that in your logs. You can set up your own interceptors. You just have to follow the behavior for an interceptor. I actually had to write one of these earlier this week because I was working with tracing and we wanted to make sure all this gRPC requests were traced. Uh, so I just wrote a little interceptor for our server. And then finally you get kind of like your router part. Um, you're just saying I'm running the Pokemon repo that Pokemon service that service and then you don't have to set any paths or anything like additional here just because each of these servers can only uh, work for one service at a time. Um, the the endpoint will know where to route that request, which module to route that request to. So now we're gonna take a look at the server. So the first thing we wanna do in our server module is just say, hey, I'm using gRPC.server from the gRPC library. And then we want to pass it the service name that we are fulfilling. So in this case, we're fulfilling the Poke API, the Pokemon service service. It comes from our built-in 
built-in code that we got from our proto library. Then here, I'm just aliasing all the stuff that I got from our library too, because we're going to use it for like matching and stuff like that. Um, and then I finally define my function. So this function name has to match uh, what we said this Pokemon service would provide, which is a get Pokemon function that takes in a get Pokemon request. Uh, it also takes a parameter for a stream, but we're going to ignore that because we're not using that. And we're just going to grab the name from the get Pokemon request to use it to get that Pokemon. So here in line 13, I have an actual like data source get Pokemon name that takes in a Pokemon name and returns like Pokemon data from the Poke API. But you don't have to know any of that implementation. If you want to see it, then I'm going to share all these all these GitHub uh, libraries are actually on my GitHub if you want to see them. Uh, they just start with elixirconf underscore everything. So you can get to them if you want to. But anyways, all this data source thing does is get the Pokemon that of the name that you got. And then it returns an OK Pokemon. And the Pokemon is just a map, map with atom keys in exactly the format we define in our proto. I didn't want to spend time kind of like parsing it. So it'll come in the shape that we expect to return to the client. Um, so we're just going to grab that and we're going to put it into a Pokemon response. So we just use here the built-in functions that come with these modules. So I do a get, re get Pokemon response that new and I pass it a, this takes a keyword list or an atom key map. Uh, so then I just pass it the Pokemon in a newly created Pokemon struct from our Pokemon data. And that gets returned to the client. Um, if anything goes wrong, I'm just going to log out that we had an error. And then I am going to abide by our contract and return a Pokemon response that new. If you don't, the server will return a 500 and your client will have no idea what happened. Uh, here's sometimes when we want to put a map of string to string, string key to string value error ski into our get Pokemon response just to tell the client what happened. So that's a great use case for a map. And then you just start your server by calling mix grpc.server in your command line. And that will make the server available at localhost 8080. So now we're gonna write our client. This is gonna be a completely different app because we're simulating microservices here. Um, so just plain Elixir app again. And then we're just gonna have a client file in which we're going to uh, call out to our server. So the first thing we wanna do, I'm just aliasing some stuff. I alias this the stub separately. So you guys remember Pokemon service, that stub is our thing that we're going to use to call the function remotely. Um, then I alias all of the modules that we're going to use. Then I'm just sending like a little module attribute for our URL and it's going to be set at localhost 8080 like I mentioned before. And then we start our client function. This can be called whatever you want. We just know it takes in a Pokemon name and it's just gonna return some Pokemon data. And the first and only implementation detail for gRPC is establishing this connection, which returns an, a channel that then you can use to make requests. And this is a little bit confusing because as you can see, it's also called a stub, um, but it's different from a Pokemon service stub. This is just to establish that connection. So we call grpc.stub.connect and we pass it our URL of the where the Pokemon service is hosted. And then we can optionally pass a list of options with deadline, timeout, et cetera. So that returns an okay in a channel if everything goes well. If you don't have your server running, you're not gonna get an okay, all right? Um, and then we just build our request. We have to build our request struct so we can pass it to our get Pokemon um, function. So we just build that by passing the name and just creating a new struct that we then return here in our with statement. And then on line 15, you can see I'm actually finally using my Pokemon service built-in stub that comes with the get Pokemon function. And that takes in a channel as its first argument and then our request. And if everything goes well, you get a big get Pokemon response with a Pokemon. And you can just return that. So like you can see here, this client is really nice. It's like skinny and efficient. I didn't have to do any parsing because I get structs with guaranteed types and I love it because it's just so beautiful, it's so beautiful. Um, so now we're just gonna test it out. Um, I open an AIX session on my client. I have my server running at localhost 8080 in another um, session, you know, 
and I just do pokedex.client.getpokemon. I pack, I pass in uh, my favorite Pokemon's name, Pikachu, and then uh, we just send that over and we get our okay tuple with our Pokemon struct with all the data I was expecting, all the fields, Poke the moves you can see that come also in this move struct, which is really nice. Um, so I love it. I, I really like it. It comes back ready to go. So we went through a lot, guys. We're done with the demo, at least. Um, so now we're just gonna go through a little recap of everything we did. And what we did was we first defined a contract and a service and its intake types, and output types, and everything in our profile. Then we used that file to generate Elixir code um, that then we then imported into our two Elixir apps so they could communicate with each other in this common language. And we wrote this service for server for the service we defined. We wrote a client that then just called a function in this module within itself that just made this remote request to the server. And yeah, then we got a, a successful client. Uh, we made a successful client request and got a successful client response from our server. So that was a lot to do in like just like 10 minutes, huh? Anyways, um, I want to tell you about a little bit how NAV uses uh, the protocol buffer gRPC stuff. Um, so we use it a little bit differently. We keep our proto definition separate from our generated code. So this is kind of like the process we follow. So when someone wants to make a change to a type or add a method to a service, we just make a proto repo branch and that has all the changes that a developer wants to make. And then it kind of goes through this review process. The engineers that are like involved can comment on it and make sure that our entities look like we want them to look. And then if that goes well, then it gets merged into our proto repo master branch. And from that proto repo master branch, this is just proto files. We even have a linter in there that'll make sure that all the, all the service names end with service, all the fetching, um, methods start with fetch, et cetera. It's really nice because then nobody can like have weird names for stuff. Um, and then using that proto repo, we generate code for all the languages. So each language has its own repo with the generated code from this proto repo. For example, the Elixir one just reaches out proto repo, gets all this proto definitions and then generates the code. And then that's the proto that gets imported by our microservices and used. And same with the rest of the applications. And then it's really easy for them to communicate. And this is working pretty great. We actually really love it. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's an ideal state for our backend services to communicate strictly via gRPC. We're not there yet because you know things take time. We have a ton of services that we have to move over, but we're slowly making progress. I would say that the only bump in this uh, love story was the protocol buffers being nil, at least from the Elixir side, because we use nil a lot. I don't know if for the gophers or go people, it was a bump. I think they might like that nil doesn't exist. I don't know. Anyways, it's working out great. We're learning a lot and we're really enjoying it. And I can keep you updated uh, via my Twitter. And also, um, if you have any questions and I can't answer them today, just feel free to tweet me. And we are also, go, uh, NAV is hiring. So if you really like this cool tech and wanna work in it, uh, don't guarantee that you're gonna be doing Elixir all the time. You might have to do some Go and some Ruby, but we have front end positions open. We have back end, we have principal engineers, architect, et cetera. So if you're interested, just make sure you check out our website. Um, thank you, Catalina, that was great. Thank you so much.